Griffin is narrating his story to Dr. Kemp in his study. When Colonel raids Kemp's house to nab Griffin, Griffin has already told that after attaining invisibility and having a fight with his landlord for non-payment of the rent, he sets fire to the house. Then he tells how he suffers against the cold of a chilly winter and in other ways. He is hit by people, vehicles or their loads owing to his invisibility. He has some fun on the way also. Dogs sniff and follow him and his footprints attract curious crowds. He slips into a London store and spends a night there, steals food and clothes and sleeps in cozy comfort. But in the morning, he has to escape, becoming invisible once again when the storekeepers detect him as a thief. Then he enters a costumer's shop and injuring its owner, he covers himself well with theatrical costume to be visible again. Then he goes to Ipping for the first time and from Ipping to Park Stowe and from there to Burdock, giving a chase to Marvel the Tramp. Then he hides in a house there, which happens to belong to an old acquaintance, Dr. Kemp. While he is trying to make Dr. Kemp his accomplice in unleashing a reign of terror in the country, Colonel Aidy raids the house with two constables. But Griffin succeeds in escaping from there by removing his clothes. Now, Colonel Aidy and Dr. Kemp are discussing their strategies to nab the invisible man. He's mad, inhuman. He's pure selfishness. He thinks of nothing but his own advantage, his own safety. He has wounded men. He will kill them unless we can prevent him. He dreams of a reign of terror. A reign of terror, I tell you. You must set a watch on trains and roads and shipping. The garrison must help. And you must prevent him from eating or sleeping. Day and night the country must be astir for him. Food must be locked up and secured, all food, so that he will have to break his way to it. The houses everywhere must be barred against him. What else can we do? I must go down at once and begin organizing. But why not you come? Yes, you come too. Come, and we must hold a sort of council of war. Come along, tell me as we go. What else is there we can do? He's got away, sir. One of you go on down and get a cab to come up and meet us quickly. And now, Kem, what else? Dogs. Get dogs. They don't see him, but they wind him. Get dogs. Good. Bear in mind, his food shows. After eating, his food shows until it is assimilated, so that he has to hide after eating. You must keep on beating every thicket, every quiet corner, and on the roads. Yes. Powdered glass be spread. It's cruel, I know. But think of what he may do. Neither one knew where he went, nor what he did. But one could imagine him hurrying through the hot June forenoon, up the hill and on to the open downland behind Port Burdock, raging, heated and weary and stopping amidst the thickets of Hintondean to piece together his shattered schemes. Mounted policemen rode along the country lanes, stopping at every cottage and warning the people to lock up their houses and keep indoors unless they were armed, and all the elementary schools had broken up by three o'clock, and the children, scared and keeping together in groups, were hurrying home. Before nightfall, a thrill of horror went through the whole watching nervous countryside, going from whispering mouth to mouth past the story of the murder of Mr. Wicksteed. Mr. Wicksteed, 45 or 46, a steward to Lord Burdock, was found murdered near a gravel pit a couple of hundred yards out of his way back home. The girl who had seen him going through a field to the gravel pit 
could only do pantomime of his action. It showed that he was pursuing something being dragged on the ground before him and was striking at it again and again with his walking stick. Excited and curious, he kept on beating this strange locomotive and taking fun in the game. Tried to drive it in the corner between a thicket and a gravel pit. The name of the invisible man had not reached his place and he could hardly imagine that the invisible man had plucked the rod from a fence on the roadside and was on his way to accomplish something. Being eccentric and irascible, he took the game as interference and attacked Mr. Wicksteed brutally, inflicting numerous wounds, breaking his arm and smashing his head to a jelly. Mr. Wicksteed was going home to his midday meal. He was the invisible man's first victim, bloody and pitiful at his feet. Groups of policemen were in lookout for the invisible man with their noisy, yelping dogs. In the night, he must have eaten and slept, for in the morning he was himself again, active, powerful, angry and malignant, prepared for his last great struggle against the world. <laughs>